Renowned Great Balls of Fire author and acclaimed rock and roll photographer Murray Silver Jr. discusses his legendary grandfather Wolf Silver, a.k.a. Bo Peep, the family involvement with the Prohibition era, other scandals and adventures, all told Bonaventure Graveside, of course, on this episode of Grave Talks with Shannon Scott. <laughs> Today is the 121st anniversary of my grandfather. And I'm out here cleaning stones and uh, maintaining what is perpetual care these days. Sure. Um, but uh, I come out here and um, I light incense, I clean stones, I make sure everything is in order, and I say my prayers, give thanks, and sometimes ask for favors. Ah, uh, sure. So that's what's going on today. It smells like you've got some frankincense burning down there. Well, I'm sure you know better than I, but in the Bible somewhere, God says to the Hebrews, uh, if you ever want to get my attention, burn this stuff. <laughs> Seriously. Well, no, I think that's beautiful. I think that's, that's what beautiful. he said. He said, if you want to try my attention, burn frankincense. I don't know what I don't know what book it's in. I don't know. I don't either, but I would I would I think it's a safe bet to say God has a um, uh, keen sense of smell. Well, let's hope. Right. That's up. Um, so now, when you say your grandfather, you're of course talking about the legendary Bo Peep. That is where this man's final resting place is. Okay. Wolf Silver, born on this date in 1899. They made a mistake when they first carved the date. Oh shoot! They were too cheap to start it all over. So 1899. He was born in London, England, to Polish Jewish parents. Here to the left. The family name was not Silver. The family name was Amdursky. 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 And, and the story about how the, the name came to be is interesting. They came, after my grandfather was born in London and they immigrated to the United States, the Amdursky family was on a ship that sank and the family was split up. Two brothers. My great grandfather Max and his brother. When they got to the United States, different ports of entry, Max's brother simply shortened the name to Amder. And I still have cousins to this day whose last name is Amder. Wow. But my great-grandfather here, when he got to the United States, and they asked him what his name was, he looked up, and the first sign that he saw was a sign for the Silver Coffee Company. He said, that's my name. And that is how we became known as the Silvers. Do you like a good cup of coffee? I do. No, did he? I don't know. I can't vouch for him. All we I were say... talking about smell. Coffee was, you know, aromatic in the city streets. You wonder if, like, the smell caught his attention first and then the sign. Well, he, he, all I know is the way the story is related. Fair enough. He saw the sign, took the name. And that's how we became known as Silvers. And so this is my great-grandparents. Uh... Three of their sons, a daughter, and her family. The only person missing is, is Bo Peep's wife, who did not want to be buried in the ground. I've always wanted to know that. Well, she was Catholic, and she was Catholic all day, every day, from the moment she was born to the day she died, and Irish Catholic at that. She did not want to be buried in the ground, and uh, she died in, in Miami, Florida, and she is buried there. We, we till this day, talk about moving her here. At least the Catholic cemetery, because there's no room at the inn. And now my father and I have bought something out in left field over there. But um, That's near the cow pasture, right? Well, whatever it used to be, I just call it left field. So that's where we have staked out our stone. The mailbox is in place ready to do business. And uh, one day all too soon. But in any event, this is the original silver plot. And it's, it's now booked up. Except... We, we wedged my, my, my grandfather's oldest son, Julian. He is wedged in here. He, he was cremated and buried in this tiny little spot right here. Daddy Jewel, the cool fool, who was well known in Savannah, Georgia, as a jive-talking DJ. 
<laughs> and also an ace car salesman for the Kaminsky's. No and kidding. This is, this is where Daddy Jewel reposes next to his daddy. And, and uh, But that's the only way we could get him in because there's, there's no more room for boxes. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, he, now, remind me of the relationship to Wolf again. Well. Of Julian. This, this, well, Julian is, is Wolf's oldest son. My, my uncle. Oldest son. Yes. Colorful character. For sure. Now, I, I'm greatly uh, well known for uh, referring to the Silvers of Savannah as one of the great cast of characters of Savannah's past. Would you agree with that statement? Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. And, of course, the most legendary character, I think, is, you know, beside yourself, but, you know, history, uh, history, the jury's still out historically, but was definitely your grandfather, Bo Peep, as he was known, born Wolf Silver here. Um, would you care to speak to his legend? And Well, um, what he is known for and remembered for even to this day was he had a bar on Congress at Drayton which is now a parking lot directly across from Christ Church. Um, when he was all of 18 years old, prohibition was ratified and enacted. At the time, the Silvers lived in a uh, over under a store. They lived above a store on the corner of Williamson and what is now MLK, then West Broad. It is now a new hotel. So they owned, they owned the building. They had a, a corner market. And uh, at the age of 18, as prohibition is being enacted, my grandfather started selling whiskey by the shot from behind the counter. And he would go to New York and bring back suitcases filled with pint bottles of whiskey. And that's how he began the, uh, his, his illegal whiskey business trade. And so he would make these trips up to New York and bring back a suitcase or two pint bottles and when he made enough money he bought a car and started going up there and bringing back whiskey by the car load and then bought the biggest car on the road which at the time was a Cadillac it had the biggest payload and um, the, the shipments now started getting larger and so were the profits which I have to inject if you don't mind clearly he was not doing this in a in a, in a blind spot of the real mover and shakers of let's say rum running and gangstering so how do you quantify that or define his ability to do all that so freely if that if i can use that word well remember savannah's on the coast so you can get to it by water and that's important and i'll tell you why in a minute okay he was starting out as he was a road man he was going from here to new york and then from here to to new orleans mm -hmm. where bugs moran was running the show right so at such a point in time that he had a convoy a fleet of Cadillacs, he would pay six friends to get behind the wheel and they would take a convoy to New Orleans and pick up whiskey by the barrel and bring it back here. And the distribution point now mm -hmm. was the Mendel building on Congress Street. It was set up as a pool room and a restaurant and upstairs there were a few rooms to let. And uh, my grandfather was now selling whiskey out of that spot. He was no longer a middleman and now he was selling whiskey by the drink illegally during prohibition and in plain view how did he do that he paid off everybody mm -hmm. he had the biggest lawyer in town shelby myrick who paid the judges he paid scopey dillon the police chief paid him off scopey would come over to the house on washington avenue about once a month and get cash sit in the living room and ask my grandfather my sounds grandfather, like the tour sounds like the tour business today well <laughs> touche but in any event he paid everybody in town so that he could continue doing what he was doing. And at the same time that he was selling whiskey, he was also taking bets. He was on the wire. He had a federal gambling stamp. And he made uh, more money gambling than he did selling whiskey. But the bottom line is, from 1918 till 1933, when Prohibition ended, he made an absolute fortune selling whiskey in Savannah, Georgia. Now, Savannah became strategically important to the mob because it was off the radar. And so uh, gangsters on the lam from Chicago, New York, would come and hide out on Wilmington Island. And I'm sure you know the story of the General Oglethorpe Hotel. Sure. Where my father, who went into the practice of law in 1953, remembers one of his first clients was the mobster Frank Costello, who his daddy took him to meet at the General Oglethorpe Hotel. 
Wow. So a lot of big names used to hide out on Little Wilmington Island. Because you know if you Savannah ever met was always strategic in, as far as uh, bringing whiskey into the country and then distributing it to other areas. Do you know if you ever ran into Castro? Um, I will tell you this. <laughs> That's a funny story. My Uncle Julian, who was a car dealer, and my father had gone down to Cuba with the idea that they were going to open the first Cadillac dealership in Havana. Amazing. And then the revolution took place, and that was the end of the deal. Yeah. But my father and his brother, just like in the Godfather movie, they go down to Cuba, and they're talking to, uh, what was the guy before Kester? Who oh, was the guy? I'm bl that's... The guy they overthrew. Uh, um, they, they had a deal with him. They were going to, they were going to sell <laughs> So, Kelly, and on on my shelf, on my trophy shelf at home, is a bottle of Methuselah rum that is dated about 1950, or something like that. My father brought back from his that Castro gave him on a, on a, not Castro, his predecessor gave him on his trip down there to set up a, the Cadillac lot that never was. Wow. And you know Red's Helmy, Red's yes. Helmy who tried to invade Cuba. Yes. Well, Red's and my father, lifelong friends, they were BC together. Amazing. So when all, all the dots connect, this is Savannah. <laughs> In fact, Shannon, I can take you around this cemetery and introduce you to cousins of mine in just about every other plot. We will do that next encounter, <laughs> for sure. I will. <laughs> I know that uh, I and the watching crowd will uh, be. Well, after seven generations, I'm related to everybody in Savannah <laughs> that ain't Chinese. <laughs> I could swear I saw a Chinaman that looked just like you. Um, so. What are some of the other, I mean, because I know the, the audience will be curious, but what were some of the other big underworld names that your father had dealings with, ran across, shared a, a drink with, you know, any well, level? One of the biggest, uh, if, I, if, I, if I have um, reminded Savannah of anything that it had forgotten and should never have, it's uh, the close association at times with Shoeless Joe Jackson, the great ball player. Okay. Shoeless Joe Jackson began his pro career in Savannah, Georgia, and ended his pro career in Savannah, Georgia. Married, married a Savannah girl, bought several houses around town, but in the off-season owned a pool hall next door to my grandfather's on Congress Street mm -hmm. in partnership with the Sullivan Brothers. He also owned two dry cleaning establishments downtown, and Savannah had conveniently forgotten that. But Shoeless Joe Jackson, certainly still one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game, and one of the most controversial because of the Black Sox scandal, he was he was a Savannah boy, and he was a dear friend of my granddad's. Mm. Because when my granddad's pool room was in business, which was basically from the late 20s until 1958, mm -hmm. I want to say, anybody and everybody that came to Savannah came in and hung out at my granddad's place because of his connections with the liquor world and the gambling world. So any all of the ball players, all of the boxers, all of the pool sharks, like Minnesota Fats, all of those guys that came through town would come into Bo Peeps. Mm. So because he was on the wire, he was connected to the, the mob that controlled gambling in America. And uh, he, had, he had done business with Capone, Moran, with all of the guys, all the made guys in the mafia. But you got to remember back then, these were just businessmen. They weren't, they weren't anything like the people they are today. I mean, they're not, they weren't the, the figures that, that they are today. They were, they were criminals. And a lot of them, you, you know, you didn't know them if you met them. Sure. And so my grandfather, unfortunately, died in 63 when I was 10. And before I could retrieve all of his stories. But thankfully, I ran into a group of his old buddies that included Buster White and Tony Yatro. Wow. And I talked to them at length before they passed. Oh, wow. You're and lucky. Got, got some of the really great stories about my grandfather that I... I, I uh, set forth in a book called Behind the Moss Curtain and Other Great Savannah Stories, which is now in its 10th edition. Which, by the way, for any watcher, that's the, the book I, uh, is my number one recommended book for Savannah Stories, Behind the Moss Curtain, by uh, present company, Mr. Murray Silver Jr. I want that to be my next movie. If they ever start making movies. Again. When you, okay, so when you mean... You mean the whole book or part of it? Oh no! I, you know, I, I dream of doing a a movie that includes my favorite stories about my grandfather at Bo Peep's. The name of his the name of his bar was Bo Peep, and I'll tell you how he got his nickname. Um, he was on a run to New Orleans with the guys, and he loaded up the car with the liquor, and he's on his way back to Georgia 
when he gets stopped by the state patrol in Alabama. And they uh, arrest him, they take him to jail, confiscate all the liquor, and my grandfather strikes a deal to cut everybody loose and keep the cars, promising that he will never, ever, ever cross the Alabama state line again. And so they come back in the convoy of empty Cadillacs, and as they rolled into town, some street corner pundit standing on the corner said, Little Bo Peep has lost his sheep. <laughs> and from that moment on, my grandfather was known as Bo Peep. And everybody, including my grandmother, called him that till the day he died. And the name of his place was Bo Peeps. And you can still go on eBay now and find old matchbook covers that have got the name on it. No way. And the logo was a black sheep. And some people old enough to remember the front window of Bo Peeps downtown had a, had a painting of a black sheep on it. <laughs> so that's how he got the nickname. Wow. So yeah, he he turned it into um, something, uh, I guess a term of endearment, I suppose. Well, Shannon, you know, the thing is this, and it, it bears uh, mentioning. Uh, the reason why my grandfather is remembered by more people than that is the way he died. He died by his own hand in 1963 after he had been betrayed by all of the people he had paid off. He had basically run out of money and uh, he, he was pushed into closing his business when the city city attorney at the time came to my grandfather and said that he wanted a payoff of $600 a week. And my grandfather said, look, I'm already paying my lawyer, the judges, the police chief. He said, I can't take you on at that level. And the guy said, well, either you do it or we're going to shut you down. And that's exactly what happened to my grandfather. He was forced to sell the building, which was then torn down so that nobody would ever come on to that space and run another concern. It sits as a vacant lot today because my grandfather put a curse on it. He vowed that nobody would ever move on to that site. And to this day, that vacant lot is the most, it is the most valuable vacant lot in all of Savannah, Georgia. You're right about that, I can attest. And it sits there vacant after more than 50 years because my grandfather put a curse on it because he, he died by his own hand in the building across the street. It was then the John Wesley Hotel. and uh, Now the Planters Inn. And, where, and it is reported that he is still in residence. Interesting. When he's not haunting my house, he's haunting that one. Now my question to you then, and not to cut you off, but since I have you on the spot, <laughs> I'll, I'll take advantage of the fact that you know, you're on camera. Um, and, and I don't mean to make light of it at all, because I know your grandfather was incredibly important to you. The last night of his life, if I recall correctly, he snuggled in bed with you almost like a, in a way of saying goodbye. Well, Is that true? Before he checked into the hotel. Okay. And then he wasn't going to do this in our house. Right. And then he spent the last night of his life sharing uh, our house, sharing my bedroom with me. Yeah. I was 10 years old. And you dedicated your book behind the moss curtain to him or his memory, I, I recall. Yeah, well, if it wouldn't, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have written the book. For sure. And the best parts are about him and Buster White and and that colorful cast of characters that made Savannah what it was in those days. Thank you. And and honestly, honestly, there were about a hundred guys running around Savannah, Georgia, in the 30s and the 40s, larger than life. Every single one of them was, you know, a character. I mean it. And, and I, I met some of the fading uh, stars, as it were. Well, Tony <laughs> Atro, Mr. Ah, White. Tony, legend. Two of my very, very favorites. I could never get now. See, he only knew me from running the deli, and he, he came in with all the Greek guys in the morning at Eli's Deli. Yeah. And so for three and a half years, he was a regular, and he knew me. And he was tough as nails, as we know. Oh, my goodness. The stories about him pummeling teenagers on Broughton Street when they tried to mug him. Amazing. But he would only tell me a little bit about being a prison guard at the old Savannah Jail, old city jail. But you could tell he really didn't want to dredge up the past. So he, and of course, you all had more of a history than than he and I, but I, I really re regret not being able to, you know, pick his brain a little more, but I understood where he was coming Shannon, from. The, pr the problem is, is I have discovered, it's like my grandfather, the story is a great one until you get to the end of it, and it doesn't end well for any of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is the tragic thing about Savannah, there's a cloud that hangs over it all the time. It doesn't end well for any of us. It seems like that sometimes. I know what you mean. It's hard to debate the beauty as it as it sits still, but I know what you mean. The mechanics are a, a little dark. 
Well, let me ask you this: um, do you do you suspect that your your grandfather's um, suicide was because of the insurance money that the family would receive, or is or am I incorrect in thinking that? Yeah, they don't pay off for, for suicide. Okay. And uh, all I can tell you is that my grandmother spent the rest of her life uh, living very, very, very modestly in an apartment in Miami, even though she had a son who was a famous doctor and a son who was a famous lawyer. She, she lived with Julian, her oldest son, until she died. And she, uh, I, I, she was past her, her materialism. Life, her life, her life, effectively ended when his life ended. Right. And and she said that her dreams were often haunted by him. Uh-huh. That he would appear to her uh, on the eve of anyone becoming sick or dying in our family. If there's any bad news, he was the precursor. He would show up in her dreams. But the thing is, um, no, my my grandmother died in in Miami. She she lived very 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 modest circumstance. And in fact, the sad thing was. When she died, she had had left several thousand dollars to, to her children, all of whom had a lot more money than she did. Aww. But that's just the way that she yeah. was. She's from that old school. That's just the way that she Yeah, was. man. Well, um, so it would have been such a great thing to be a fly in the wall at Bo Peeps. Um, you were clearly old enough to have a little memory of it, correct? Yeah. And what, what, what really comes to mind? What was the smell at Bo Peeps? Well, I've got some photographs in the car. Okay. That I was showing earlier today. And if you'd like to see, I'll be glad to show you. Oh, yeah. Um, they show him in his heyday. He was quite a dapper guy. I could tell. Um, he started making a lot of money very quickly. And um, so by the, the early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, my grandfather was already a made guy in Savannah, Georgia. had a lot of money. And so um, the thing that I remember most... Um, the one, the one fragrance that comes to mind most of all is the smell of garlic cooking in beef. My grandfather was famous at Bo Peeps for having the best roast beef sandwich ever invented. And it was a steamship round that he got specially from the armor company through his brother-in-law. And they would bring it in every Monday. It was huge cut of beef that they embedded with cloves of garlic. And they put it in an oven. And there was a vent that blew that smell onto Congress Street. <laughs> and by noon, all of downtown is going, yeah, it's time for lunch. And they would go to Bo Peeps for a roast beef sandwich, which put him on the map. Yes. And so when you ask me what is the smell that comes to mind, it is roast beef embedded with the garlic. That now, is the smell of my childhood. Now tell me some of the the famous mouths that devoured those sandwiches because there's quite a list we're talking robert mitchum yeah. gregory peck yeah i mean do, you, do any others come to mind i mean I've... the new york yankees used to stop in savannah every year on the way to spring training to play uh, an exhibition game here they hung out at bo peeps all the ball players the prize for i've got photographs of sugar ray robinson joe lewis jake lamada Primo Carnera, Jack Dempsey, all of those guys would come and hang out at Bo Peeps. And I've, I've got some great, great, great photographs because at the time there was a guy working for the newspaper around the corner and all my Uncle Junior had just pick up the phone and say, yeah, yeah, Jack Dempsey's over here. And they'd run over and take pictures. And I've got a bunch of them. Wow. Because when I tell people, they go, you, you're lying, man. And I said, no, here's the pictures to prove it. And now, <laughs> Here's the other thing. At the same time my grandfather's uh, running a show down on Congress Street, Julian is a DJ here in Savannah. And Julian is interviewing all of the stars that come to town to promote records and movies. Mm-hmm. And I mean, back in the day, in the late 40s and early 50s, before the rock and roll era, uh, that's what these stars would do. Perry Como would come to town to do a show. He'd go to the radio station, do an interview. He'd sit around all day. They'd spin platters to tell stories. And Julian interviewed everybody in the game and music then. And I've got autographed photographs of the Andrews sisters and the Lennon sisters and Patty Page and Perry Como and Frank Sinatra. And I mean, everybody. Where's he DJing? Um, I forget the call letters of the station. Oh, so we're talking radio. Yeah. Okay, okay. I he thought- was on radio. And here's the thing. Because he loves sports, he became the radio's sports director as well 
and he covered everything in sports because he wanted to get tickets to games and so forth. And he interviewed all of the athletes that came through town and usually would hang out at Bo Peeps. He'd then take them to the radio station. So they're catching them going and coming, Shannon. And I can't imagine there was anybody that came to Savannah, Georgia in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. I don't care if it's politics, sports, music, movies. I don't care what it is. They would have come through Bo Peeps and they would have sat in front of the microphone with Michael Julian. And yeah. I've got stacks of photographs that I recently discovered when, when Julian died. His stuff was in boxes and I uncovered his scrapbooks. And he was a scrapbooker. Wow. And I opened it and I could not believe <laughs> what I found. Wow, man. Now, not to disparage Julian, but there is that funny story about the Super Bowl in 1967. Do you care to share? Here lies the man that tried to fix the Super Bowl. <laughs> My Uncle Julian was one of, they were called the Miami Seven. It was the year that the Pittsburgh Steelers played the Dallas Cowboys, one of the greatest games ever played. I had gone down there to see the game. I was living in Atlanta. I was in college. I wanted to go down there to see the game because I loved the Dallas Cowboys. Early on a Sunday morning, the day of the game, there's a knock at the door of my grandmother's apartment. It's the FBI, and they got a warrant for my Uncle Julian. <laughs> they were looking for him. Turns out, long story short, Julian and a couple of friends had conspired to fix the, the Super Bowl. They, they had deduced that you didn't have to buy off a lot of people to do it. You only needed one key player, and that was a quarterback. Mm. And they had supposedly put together a deal. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which quarterback, but they had put together a deal to throw the Super Bowl. Right. And they were all arrested. And they were all put on trial. Except the quarterback, right? Yeah, that's right. No <laughs> players were involved, but the uh, the FBI broke up the uh, plot. But that was Michael Julian. And he did a little time where? Uncle Julian, I forget. You know, he did time down in Florida, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, there's a couple of beefs that he had, a couple of raps. And you know what? It was not spoken about in my family because that was our uncle. Yeah. And even though my father was his lawyer, we didn't talk about him like that. All I know is every so often I would get a letter from him that was in a couple of different envelopes. <laughs> and um, we were pen pals. I loved him. He loved me. We were pen pals. And I never fully understood exactly where he was or for what. And because my father did not want to disrupt my relationship with him. No doubt. And, and Good when thing. he got out, we didn't talk about it. We just went <laughs> on. We just kept on keeping on. I think it's interesting. I mean, with Silvers, this is what we do. Yeah, right. No doubt. No doubt. Well, you know, what comes to mind, too, is that if I'm not mistaken, because I used to live uh, in Grant Park in Atlanta, so I would drive by the old federal penitentiary, mm -hmm. and I would think of your, your grandfather because that was the jail, the prison he was in. No. No, he wasn't in the, with the same one of uh, Capone? No. No, 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 no. No. But he was, my grandfather did. he was sentenced there, though. My grandfather right? was sentenced to do two. He had enough money. He had enough money to pay off everybody so that he could serve his time in a hotel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He didn't spend one day in a prison cell. But didn't he come he back during the day hotel. and sort of carouse and like put on the face that he was in jail during the day and went went to the hotel at night or no? No, the thing is, well, the thing is, look, there, there might have been some of that. All I know is this. My grandmother and my aunt moved up to Atlanta while he was there. And again, they didn't tell us, kid, I was 10 years old. They didn't tell us kids where granddad had gone right. or why. They didn't discuss. They didn't tell us that he was in jail. Sure. And it was a very long time because... My, look, to this day, my father finds it very hard to talk about these things 50 years later. Sure. So the thing is that we never knew these things as they were happening, but it was later that I had to go back and, and piece it all together. But my grandfather did not spend his time in jail. He spent it in a hotel, and it cost him a lot of money to do that. But um, now my grandmother lived in Atlanta for a couple of years with my aunt. and Worked at Macy's, right? And then, then they then they packed up and they moved to Florida because Julian had gone down there and gotten a job selling cars where he was the number one national salesman for Pontiac. And so they, they all went down. Julian, my grandfather, my grandma, they lived together down in Miami. And then two of uh, their other children followed them down there. We were the only ones that didn't go to Florida. My and, father took us to Atlanta instead. And it's true that uh, Julian wore tiger skin jackets? I have it at home. <laughs> <laughs> made out of car seat material. No. He was the leader of an all-black 
swing band. And <laughs> Julian came out on stage wearing a tiger skin jacket that was made out of car seat material. It's still in perfect condition today. I got it at home. I'll show it to you one day. All right. And Daddy Jewel the Cool Fool won the very first national awards as a DJ for Apollo Records. I have a photograph of him on the stage of the Apollo receiving the first national award for a white DJ that played race records on a Amazing. major station. Amazing. This is before Alan Freed. Right. People talk about Alan Freed and the first cat that did right. No, no. My Uncle Julian was doing it the same time Alan Freed was, and, and we did it in small markets. See, Julian was down in Alabama. Yeah. And he was in Savannah. Alan was in Cleveland. Big difference. Yeah, I love it. But the, but there for you know the grace of God goes Alan Freed right here. <laughs> and if, if if I if I succeed at what I want to do before I die, I will perfect his story as well. I hope so. Because it's a great one. Yeah, I can tell. And I, I would like to just kind of make a personal plug that I think your father uh, should do what he can to reprint his book about Bo Peep. Uh, Bo Peep, This Ain't No Fairy Tale by Murray Silver Sr. I think that's just, you know, it's, it's a small classic, but wow, it, the punch, your dad's quite a writer. He doesn't pull any punches. Um, some of the book <clears throat> people have deemed to be offensive by modern day standards, but the things he was complaining about in that book were very true back then and um, my father writes about it he doesn't in other words he doesn't go back and gloss over history he writes it exactly the way that it was and there were some people that found things in there that were offensive and I think that's the reason that the book isn't bigger than it was I'm but so glad I have thing, one copy I have one copy Shannon to tell you the truth the reason my father wanted to publish that book is he he my father didn't particularly care for my take on his daddy's story my father doesn't talk about his father's suicide in his book. I understand. He only wanted to talk about the, the good things and the happy things and yeah. the funny things. Like it's a Hollywood movie My in a way. father did not want his father to be remembered for the way he died, but for the way he lived. Yes, sir. Because a lot of it had been forgotten. A lot of people forget that my, my grandfather at one point in time was one of the single biggest contributors to, to charities in the city. That's right. I, I meant to mention that he was such a civic-minded human being. You know, he helped build schools and... Social soup halls, kitchens soup all. kitchens, the whole thing. And I, I love that story about the window on the lane of Bo Peeps. And if you were down on your luck in that sort of depression-ish era, that you could get a, a roast beef sandwich that would last you for days for kind of for free. And then you didn't have to pay him back if he, if he gave you some money out the window. And Well, th Thanksgiving is coming up. There's still people in Savannah, Georgia, whose families remember a time when on Thanksgiving, the poor of Savannah would line up in Congress Street Lane and they would receive free baskets of food to take home. Amazing. And and seemingly at all of the times of the year, my grandfather was known for that. He was a very generous man. Yes, sir. And so that's the thing. That's the person my father wanted to 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 lionize in his book. <clears throat> my father doesn't like the fact that I talk about the way his father died or the circumstances. He just rather not. It's too painful. I, I, and, and here's the way I describe it too when I'm speaking uh, of your family and and Bo Peep. It's really just like he closed the, the 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 back cover of the book on his own life. I mean, it's the end. It's death. You know, it's like what really counts is that those pages in between. You know, the last page is the last page. Your grandfather just closed a book. But everything else, I mean, it's a novel. You know, it's like every writer's got to finish the story. He finished his own story. You can't, I mean, that's, that's the upside. As much as it was painful and I, I wouldn't recommend anybody doing that but that's what he did well he didn't want to be a burden to anyone yeah and i feel bad for that kind of pain that he suffered but well you know i certainly do uh, see a lot of it going on in the world right now there's a lot of people who are in that same sort of distress there's an awful lot of misery in this world and uh, it reminds me of what my grandfather went through and it's and i encounter it every day i get phone calls from people who tell me that they are losing their minds and that um sure everything is coming undone my grandfather simply did not want to be a burden. Understood. Well, may he rest in peace. Happy birthday. And I hope that we can um, somehow persuade your father to come out here and share some remembrance us, uh, remembrances with us and maybe a, a second video. But So you, you were teasing about some photographs. Yeah. So we'd love to see those Let's if you're willing. Thank you. I got some things that uh, have never been printed. This is my grandfather, 1934 Tybee. On the old original wall, that's Julian with him. 
Look at the sport. I mean, look at the, the, the sports cap. He's at the top of his game there. He would uh, already started banking some serious money. He looks like it. This is 36 with a guy named Nash, who is one of his business associates. And this is normally how you would see my grandfather when he wasn't at work. T-shirt <laughs> suspenders. Yeah. This photograph. Okay. This is just a beautiful picture. This is the family at Tybee. Now, wow. now remember, my grandfather now made enough money where he built a house on Tybee. It's on Shirley Lane. It still stands. It's wow. pretty much in its original condition. And um, so the family, and this goes back to like the 30s and the 40s, but the family would go out to Tybee and spend summers out there. Amazing. And down here in the front, that is my father. Uh, and that is Julian under his father's wing. Your father is the one right in, directly in front? That's him. No kidding. What a cutie. Now this is uh this is my father in 1935, uh, so he would be six years old, and that's uh, his little sister Kay, and that's one of the fleet of cars that my granddaddy used to import hooch with. Now who's in the who's taking the photograph? Do you know? Um, my grandfather was a big photographer. In fact, Shannon, my grandfather had a camera that took color movies. Back in the day when you had to send the entire camera to New York for them to take the film out, process it, and then load it up again and send it to you. Amazing. And I have color family movies of these days. Wow. This is Tybee 1941. This is a great candid shot of my grandfather. Top of his game. I love it. He looks very sun-kissed. Big money. That, that bathing suit, clearly Versace. No. <laughs> But yeah, that's a that's a great shot. He's he's a dreamer. Well, here's here's the best of them all. This is in front of Bo Peeps. This is 1942. It is the only picture of my grandfather at his establishment, and you can see the sheep on the window. And uh, in back of him, you can see faintly is a black chef that he had named John James, and the other chef was a guy named Chris Vatsis. A Greek fella that everybody in town knew and between John and Chris they they turned out a pretty good hot lunch amazing so I that's 1942 that the corner of Drayton and Congress in the Mendel building classic this photograph is uh, my uncle Julian says this is the first indoor photo taken with flash in the history of Savannah Georgia it's taken in in my grandparents bed on Washington Avenue and the funny thing is that um, the the light that is illuminating this shot was so hot that it uh, caught fire and just about burned down the whole house. <laughs> so it was maybe the first and the last photograph taken indoors with a flash, Savannah, Georgia. And your dad's down here on the right? Uh, that would be Julian. That's my father. Okay. That is Stanley, and that is Kay. Stanley and Kay. Kay was Miss Savannah in the 1950s. Stanley retired doctor now julian's gone my father is 91 years old last week amazing happy uh, belated birthday now the last one i have to show you this is my grandfather my grandmother happier times photo that's never been published color photograph this was at home on washington avenue when uh, all was good and there was money in the bank looks like and it everybody too. was happy and what year is this you know, uh, you're guessing. I, I, it's not dated, and I, I, I hesitate to guess, but I'm, I'm going to say it's uh, late fifties. Okay, and a, and a, a very high, high quality photograph. Yeah. Wow. Well, it does look like happier times, and you know, I think in many ways this is the family that does define um, happier times in Savannah. Well, it's been an honor all the same, and we just want to say happy uh, 121st birthday. Hey, Mr. Shannon, thank you for doing what you do. There's nobody who does it better. Thanks, Mr. Sir Silver. We appreciate your um, compliment, but we really uh, are only a voice for great things like this. So that's Savannah, that's Bonaventure, that's the Silver family, and we would really love to talk your dad into coming out. He's 91. I know. Good days, bad days. Yep, well. He was on the way with my mother, late stages Alzheimer's. Um, he got a wheelchair accessible van. He was going to come over today. There's any number of reasons why he didn't make it.
Fair enough. Well, give him my best and my regards and tell him I'm thinking of his father today. And, of course, you know, his son in that sense. And I hope he can make it over sometime. Thanks, brother. Thank you, sir. Fine, my pleasure. I told you, Shannon, it doesn't end well for any of us. Oh, shoot. It doesn't. Not if you're from here. Well, you know. Not if you're born here. Not if you live here. You, well, you know what I tell people is the number one um, leading cause of, of people dying? Life. Death. Uh -huh. <laughs>